And a fine welcome. It is Sunday, December the 28th, 2014. This is actually the last show of About Oneness for the 2014 year. And I have a very special guest with me, Crystal Vandenacker. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Um, Kevin. Hi. I thought that what we would do tonight is, because at the end of the year, it's always a bit reflective, isn't it? So... One of the things about awakening and one of the things about coming into awareness is asking questions about who we are and how we are supposed to walk through our lives. And I spend a lot of time studying Hindu masters, and and I think you do as well. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite is Sri Ramana Maharshi, and he is... Well, he's been gone for quite a long time, but in 1902, he uh, he wrote or took part in creating a treatise that uh, asked that very question about who am I. And so, what I thought we would do is quite a, it's, it's a series of 28 questions. But what I thought we would do is we would go through those questions and we would answer them as well. What do you think about that? Yes, that's fine to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. If anybody heard us in the very beginning of the show, I thought I had my mic muted and I was expressing how I was absolutely done eating any kind of cake and or pie for the rest of the year. I have cooked and baked so many cookies and pies this last month that I have I am now definitely swearing off butter, sugar, and flour for the rest of the year. So I will be eating a sattvic diet for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and stay in every meditation, trying to cleanse, cleanse everything out. But one, uh, we do have uh, we do have a phone line, and we will allow people to call in. I see already two people have called in, and they have uh, they have their hand up. So might, we might want to just check with them first, see what their um, what their questions are, and and then we'll go into the text if that's okay. For people who do want to call in, the number is three four seven. Three zero eight eight seven eight eight. But what do you say we take the first call? I'm fine with it. Okay, great. Hi, this is the nine four one area code. You're on about oneness with Karen Newman and Crystal Vandenacker. Hello. Hello. Who is this? This is Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. How are Hi. you? Did you have a question? I well, thank you been a beautiful holiday season so far, and I'm looking forward to the new year. Oh, good. Well, so are we. So are we. Yeah. As you are a medium, I just wanted to know if you had, um, were picking up any messages that would be pertinent for me at this time. Well, I'll tell you what, Catherine, we're not doing medium sh- a mediumship uh, show tonight. What we're doing is we're doing a study in uh, the text of Who Am I by Ramana Maharishi, or Ma- Maharshi, sorry. So we're not doing, uh, we're not doing any kind of uh, readings tonight. Well, then I will continue to listen. All right, great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, for... I saw the other hand went down. If just so everyone knows, if if you <laughs> the other person hung up, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. You know, Crystal and I are both mediums. That is true, but we are not doing uh, we're not doing any readings tonight. We're doing a study in our uh, spirituality study, and we're going to talk about the text "Who Am I?" and uh, we'll we'll just get into that. How's that? How's that sound? Let's start it then. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm going to give the introduction uh, mm-hmm. just so people understand uh, what this text is. And basically, you know, in, in the study of awakening and, and, tr- and trying to awaken, there's different steps that have to happen. But one of the greatest teachers was Ramana Maharshi. Um, he awakened when he was about eight years old. He had a near-death experience. And in that death experience, when he came back from it, he had awakened And from that moment, he left his house. He would speak very rarely. He didn't like to talk very much because he really felt like there wasn't always that much to say. He believed that if you put your focus inside, that all your answers were there. And that talking was only just creating a lot of stuff. And he was more interested in what was going on inside. And as happens in India, if you are a sort of standout 
saint very quickly. You are whisked off to an ashram and then <laughs> you gain many followers and people sit around and listen. But he was truly one of the, one of the gems of, of uh, his time and his teachings continue to be very, very uh, helpful and instructive. So this text is called Who Am I? If you go to Google and you, you just type in Who Am I? And then uh, Who Am I PDF and the Sri Ramana Maharshi organization uh, releases this text uh, free of charge and in English. There's a very good translation of it. And that's what we're going to be we're going to be talking on. So, the text is "Who Am I?" and this is the introduction. "Who Am I?" is the title given to a set of questions and answers bearing on self inquiry. As I had said before, uh, self inquiry was the mode of which uh, Bhagwan, which means divine, Bhagwan Sri uh, Ramana Maharshi, they call him Bhagwan for short, is how he said that you would reach enlightenment. And he, uh, so. This is a set of questions bearing on self-inquiry. The questions were put to Bhagwan Sri Ramana Maharshi by one Sri Palai about the year 1902. Sri Palai. Sri is just a, an honorary title. It's like saying the honorable. Um, Sri Palai, a graduate in philosophy, was at the time employed, and he visited uh, Bhagwan at a cave where he was meditating. And he sought for him spirit, from him spiritual guidance and solicited answers to questions relating on self-inquiry. As Bhagwan was not talking then, not because of any vow he had taken, but because he did not have the inclination to talk, he answered the questions put to him by gestures. And when these were not understood by writing, he when they were not understood the gestures, he would write down his answers. But he did not answer them with his voice, because like I said, he didn't like to talk all the time. Um, these are, uh, there. sometimes in the text there's 30 questions, but in this text there's 28. So um, we'll go through them. And basically, just so I can uh, explain again the way that these teachings go, is that along with self-inquiry, who am I constitutes the first step of instruction in Bhagwan's own words. These two are the only prose pieces among Bhagwan's works. They clearly set forth the central teaching that the direct path to self-liberation is self-inquiry. The particular mode in which the inquiry is made is lucidly set forth in the text, Who Am I? The mind consists of thoughts. The I is thought to be the first to arise in the mind. When the inquiry, who am I, is persistently pursued, all other thoughts get destroyed. And finally, the I thought itself vanishes, leaving the supreme, non-dual self, and that self with a capital S, alone. The false identification of the self, and every time I say self, I mean self with a capital S. The false identification of the self with the phenomena of the non-self, little s, as the body and the mind thus ends, and there is illumination, or as they say in Hinduism, shat sakara. The process of inquiry, of course, is not an easy one. As one inquires, who am I, other thoughts will arise. But as these arise, one should not yield to them by following them. On the contrary, one should ask, to whom do they arise? In order to do this, one has to be extremely vigilant. Through constant inquiry, one should make the mind stay its course without it allowing it to wander away and get lost in the mazes of thoughts created by itself. All other disciplines, such as breath control, meditation on the forms of God, should be regarded as auxiliary practices. They are useful insofar as they help the mind to become quiescent and one-pointed. For the mind that has gained skill and concentration, self-inquiry becomes comparatively easy. It is by ceaseless inquiry that the thoughts are destroyed and that the self realized the plenary reality in which there is not even the I thought. The experience was, is referred to as silence. This is the substance of the teaching of who am I. So do you understand that, Crystal? 
Yes, of course, I do understand that. Do you want to expand it? Well, just for the people listening as well. <clears throat> it's just like, um, I, when I read this, I would say like, being in the now, just being, and not thinking, nothing, doing nothing, being, and also being in totally silence as well. Well, silence is the result of yes, all of Yes, that's this. the result of it. Yes, and you know, when I was reading this, you think, you, as you, as you start to listen, you get to the point where you're like, when I read that the first time I heard the rest is silence. I, I was, uh, well, what that directly is from is from the musical Hair. Yeah. And, um, and there's a song, uh, and I was in the musical Hair. I did the, I was an actress and I did the, uh, the 20th anniversary tour of the show Hair. And there's a song called Walking in Space. And basically this song is sort of this meditation. It's sort of a drug trip. But at the same time, it's sort of this meditation. But it talks about getting to the point where there's just silence. And uh, Ramana Mar- Maharshi always talked about that he didn't care what you did in meditation. A lot of times you can be doing mantras and things. But he says, at the end, that's all not necessary. They're a good training ground. But the, but the point is to become one-pointed, single-focused. And when you get to that single focus... When you're focused completely just on the self, the I falls away, the I that is Karen, the I that is Crystal. Mm -hmm. And then you get, when you sort of penetrate through that, then you get to the the larger self. And even when you get to the self, eventually that all falls away. And then you get to the silence. To the nothingness. The nothingness, and that is the bliss. And that is the goal, the real goal. So he spent his time doing that all the time. That is, that's all he did. So I'm just going to read the first text, and then I'm going to read this. And we're both going to recognize this first part so much. Um, <laughs> I've done a meditation on it. It's just amazing how this keeps coming back. That's why I was so excited to do it, because... Um, I know that this is an important text for us, but also for a lot of people. I made a nice meditation on it based on another meditation that someone else has taught me, but it keeps coming back and it keeps coming back. So here we go. Um, Who am I? Okay. As all living beings desire to be happy always without misery, as is the case of everyone, there is observed supreme love for oneself, and as happiness alone is the cause for love, In order to gain that happiness, which is one's nature, and which is experienced in the state of deep sleep, when there is no mind, one should know oneself. For that, the path of knowledge, the inquiry of the form, who am I, is the principal means. Now, this starts with a series of questions, and then immediately there follows an answer. So we're... (laughs) So why don't you ask the question, and then I'll read the, the next okay. bit. Okay. Number one. Question number one. Oh, by the way, just, just to set the stage, there was a guy, and if you missed it, but I'm going to explain it because I read it in the text. There was a guy who was a philosopher. He knew of Ramana Maharshi, and he had the chance to go and sit with him. So he came to him with all the questions that he believed were the questions to life, the questions to truth, the questions to understand his place in the world. And ultimately, the goal is, you know, especially in the Hindu idea, is to become enlightened. And if you become enlightened in this earth, you break the cycle of birth and death, and you don't have to come back here. And you can move on into some other existence. So for people who are very serious about enlightenment um, and awakening, that was, is the goal. And in India, they're really serious about it. So he got, he, got Shri, uh, he got Bhagwan in a corner, and he said, okay, I've got these questions. And so these are the 28 questions that were asked. Okay, number one, Crystal. Okay. First question, who am I? (laughs) Okay, the answer is, the gross body, which is composed of seven humors, I am not. The first cognitive sense organs, the senses of hearing, touch, sight, smell, taste, which apprehend their respective objects, sound, touch, color, taste, and odor, 
I am not. The five cognitive senses, the organs of speech, locomotion, grasping, excretion, and procreation, which have as their respective functions speaking, moving, grasping, excreting, and enjoying, I am not. The five vital airs, prana, etc., which perform respectively the five functions of inbreathing, etc., I am not. Even the mind which thinks, I am not. The nisciance, which is endowed only with the residual impressions of objects, and in which there are no objects and no functionings, I am not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, so, well, let's tell the, the story. There's a, we did a really nice meditation, which is basically that is called, the meditation is called that which remains. Mm-hmm. And the meditation is that you focus on the different parts of your body and you say, if, um, am I my arm? And the answer is, no, I am not. And it's like, well, if you had no arm, would you still be you? The answer is what? Yes. Yes. And so if if so the the answer is yes, I am that which remains. And you go through every part of the body, your arms, your legs, your hands, your sex organs, everything and you when you take them all away, you're saying if all those things are gone, are you still you? And the answer is always yes, I am that which remains. Right? So that's what this first thing was saying is saying that you are not your body. You are not. So, number two. If I am none of these, then who am I? After negating all of the above mentions as not this, not this, that awareness which alone remains, that I am. The I am, I am. Mm. Okay, number three. What is the nature of awareness? The nature of awareness is existence Consciousness, bliss. Number uh, four. <laughs> you can gosh. say the number. You can say the numbers as well. Yes, yes, if I you know. want to discuss also any of them, if you have anything to add to any of the answers, that no, would be because be this fun. is this is what we already like. What it is, you know. So, I know, but I'm just saying also yeah. too. For, but the, the answers are short, but but the they're in depth. But also for people listening, if you have anything you feel inspired to add, please do. Okay. The fourth question. Mm -hmm. When will the realization of the self be gained? I love this answer. Yeah. When the world, which is what is seen, has been removed, there will be the realization of the self, which is the seer. Nothing to add. (laughs) No. No, it's just like... (laughs) Okay. uh, Number five... Mm -hmm. Will there not be realization of the self, even while the world is there, taking us real? There will not be. That's heavy. (laughs) So as long as we believe that the world is real, that anything Mm -hmm. around us is real, that we are real... Isn't this also about the illusion? In yes, which we are exactly. It's, that's what yeah. I'm saying. As long as we yeah. believe that this world is real, that we are real, that our physical bodies are real, that this is not just a great illusion, as long as we believe that... It will be there. Yeah. It will be there and we will never... We will not have the realization of self. No. Mm. Because it's all focused outwards, you know, and we will still that's be exactly focused right. outwards. Yeah. And then the, <laughs> number six... <laughs> The sixth question, why? (laughs) (laughs) Why? Yeah. The seer and the object seen are like the rope of the snake. And I love this analogy. The seer and the object seen are like the rope and the snake. Just as the knowledge of the rope, which is the substrate, will not arise unless the false knowledge of the illusory serpent goes, so the realization of the self, which is a substrate, will not be gained unless the belief that the world is real is removed. Like we said. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Number seven. Hmm. When will the world, which is the object, seem be removed? Now, this is the interesting question because everyone's always talking about, oh, everyone's awakening and becoming enlightened. Mm-hmm. I think most of us are not enlightened. You know, there's very few of us that are actually are. 
and they won't say it that they are enlightened. You know, well, exactly. You can't. You wouldn't say it. Well, you might say that you're enlightened, but the point is, is that it's if you're still seeing everything as real, if you're still not seeing through the illusion, you haven't made peace with that. Mm-hmm part of it but the, the answer to the question of when will the world um, which is seen um, be removed it's when the mind which is the cause of all cognitions and of all actions becomes quiescent the world will disappear do I need to uh, because I I think I, I want to um, uh, define the word uh, and it's not quiescent it's quiescent I want, to, I want to define the word because I've been, I'm even saying it wrong. But just to, let me just, I want to define it. I want to give a good definition so people know because it's not a common word. It's not really, no, it's not, it's, it's not really much used. Well, not, not in the American English. <laughs> well, I don't know because... Let me see. It means in the state of period... Uh, it's in a state or period of inacti- inactivity or dormancy. Okay. It means inactive. So when the mind stops, the world will disappear, basically, is yeah. what it's saying. When the mind, which is the cause of all cognitions and of all actions, becomes, or when the mind stops, becomes inactive, the world will disappear. Okay. Number eight. Number eight. What is the nature of the mind? What is called mind is a wondrous power residing in the self. It causes all thoughts to arise. Apart from thought, there is no such thing as mind. Therefore, thought is the nature of the mind. Apart from thought, there is no independent entity called the world. In deep sleep, there are no thoughts. And there is no world. In the states of waking and dream, there are thoughts. And there is a world also. Just as... I love this. I love this part. Just as the spider emits the thread of the web out of itself and again withdraws it into itself, likewise the mind projects the world out of itself and again resolves it into itself. When the mind comes out of the self the world appears. Therefore, when the world appears to be real, the self does not appear. And when the self appears, shines, the world does not appear. When one persistently inquires into the nature of the mind, the mind will leave, the mind will end leaving the self as residue. What is referred to as the self is Atman. The mind always exists only in dependence on something gross, meaning something bigger. It cannot stay alone. So the mind always exists only in the dependence on something bigger. It cannot stay alone. It is the mind that is called the subtle body or the soul. I love that imagery. Of the spider releasing. Well, that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah, because when we, when we, when we think our thoughts, we create our world. And when we stop thinking, that that world disappears. And as long as the world is appearing, the true self cannot come forward. It's like also like saying that everything which what is out there, mm-hmm. you know, our world is based on our projections, you know, what we are projecting. That's what we see, the images we see, everything, everything what we are uh, starting to create. Exactly. Exactly. Everything is our projection outwards, all of our thoughts. And it's when we stop those thoughts, then we, then our self comes forward. Okay, number nine. What is the part of inquiry for understanding the nature of the mind? That which arises as I in this body is the mind. If one inquires as to where in the body the thought I rises first, one would discover that it rises in the heart. 
that is the place of the mind's origin. Even if one thinks constantly, I, I, one will be led to that place. Of all the thoughts that arise in the mind, the I thought is the first. It is only after the rise of this and the other thoughts arise. It is after the appearance of the first personal pronoun that the second and the third personal pronouns appear. Without the first personal pronoun, there will not be the second and the third. Okay. Did you, did you get it? Yes. <laughs> okay. And I was and I was just thinking, you know, like that's why I always say, like, think with your heart, not with your head. You know? <laughs> I was just thinking that. Yeah. Okay. So, so number ten. Mm-hmm. How will the mind become? You could, just, and, and you, you could say still. <laughs> Still, yeah, that's better. How will the mind become quiescent? But how will the mind become still? Mm, That's better. Okay. By the inquiry of the question, who am I? The thought, who am I, will destroy all other thoughts. And like the stick used for stirring the burning pyre, it will itself in the end get destroyed. Then there will arise self-realization. So just like the wooden stick that you're using to stoke the fire, eventually even that will burn away. The question Mm -hmm. of asking, if you're using the inquiry method of who am I, who am I, eventually that question will also become destroyed and you will get to self-realization. And self-realization is also oneness, you know, you're being one with the whole. Yes. Yes. And it's about oneness. There it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> my show, my, the title yeah, of my show is Encompass, Encompasses the Vedantic Text. I'm so happy for that. Okay. So, number 11. Yeah. What is the means for constantly holding on to the thought, who am I? Mm. Yeah, basically, how do you do it, right? Mm. When other thoughts arise, one should not pursue them, but should inquire, to whom do they arise? It does not matter how many thoughts arise. As each thought arises, one should inquire with diligence. To whom has this thought arisen? The answer that would emerge would be, to me. Thereupon, if one inquires, who am I? The mind will go back to its source, and the thought that arose will become still, or quiet, or quiescent. (laughs) (laughs) With repeated practice in this manner, the mind will develop the skill to stay in its source. When the mind that is subtle goes out through the brain and the sense organs, the gross names and forms appear. When it stays in the heart, the names and forms disappear. Not letting the mind go out, but retaining it in the heart is what is called inwardness. Letting the mind go out of the heart is known as externalization. Thus, when the mind stays in the heart, the I, which is the source of all thoughts, will go, and the self, which never exists, will shine. Well, sorry, the, the self, which ever, not never, but the, <laughs> the self, which ever exists, will shine. Whatever one does, one should do so without the ego of I. If one acts in that way, all will appear as of the nature of Siva or God. So it's basically say, stay in the heart. Yes. yes. And live, live, live with your heart. Stay there. Yes. Mm. Okay. Number 12. Yes. Are, are there no other means for making a mind quiescent or still? <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Other than inquiry, there are no adequate means. If through other means it is sought to control the mind, the mind will appear to be controlled, but will again go forth. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. You can sort of force your mind, but actually until you sort of get it, you know, you're, you're only, you're only sort of controlling your mind. You're not actually in in the inquiry, having the realization. Mm -hmm. You should accept, you know, that like for every thought, which is there, just accept it. And not start forcing. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Through, through the control of breath, also, the mind will become still. But it will, become, it will be still only so long as the breath remains controlled. And when the breath resumes, the mind will also again start moving and will wander as impelled by residual impressions. The source is the same for both mind and breath. Thought, indeed, is the nature of the mind. The thought, I, is the first thought of the mind, and that is of ego. It is from uh, whence ego originates that the breath also originates. Therefore, when the mind becomes still, the breath is controlled. And when the breath is controlled, the mind becomes still. But in deep sleep, although the mind becomes still, the breath does not stop. This is because of the will of God, so that the body may be preserved and other people may not be under the impression that <laughs> it is dead. In the state of waking and in samadhi, when the mind becomes still, the breath is controlled. Breath is the gross form of mind. Till the time of death, the mind keeps breath in the body. And when the body dies, the mind takes breath along with it. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Therefore, the exercise of breath control is only an aid for rendering the mind still. It will not destroy the mind. You, know, you have to think about with the last thing about the exercises with the mindfulness, you know, like deep breathing and all this stuff. Well, this is what it's saying. Yeah. It says, like yeah. the practice of breath control, meditation on the forms of God, repetition of mantras, restriction of food are but aids for rendering mm -hmm. the mind still. Through meditation on the forms of God and through repetition of mantras, the mind becomes one-pointed. So they're tools. The mind will always be wandering. Just as when a chain is given to an elephant to hold in its trunk, it will go along grasping the chain and nothing else. So also when the mind is occupied with a name or form, it will grasp that alone. When the mind expands in the form of countless thoughts, each thought becomes weak. But as thoughts get resolved, the mind becomes one-pointed and strong. For such a mind, self-inquiry will become easy. Of all the restrictive rules relating to the taking of sattvic food in moderate quantities is the best. By observing this rule, the sattvic quality of mind will increase, and that will be helpful to self-inquiry. So basically, meditation is the tool. Repeating mantras is, you know, just focusing on, say, om is the tool, but eventually... Yeah. It's that letting go and going into that silence, but it's, it's allowing the, the meditation to focus you. Um, he, I, I've, just, I've studied him for a long time, and he does quite recommend a sattvic diet, which is um, vegetarian, which includes, uh, it's basically very mild foods in small quantities, um, vegetarian with dairy, but no, with, without eggs. Mm -hmm. And this is really what is inquired. And when he's been asked, he would he would never recommend it. He would never say to people, you should be vegetarian. But if they asked him, he would quite strongly say, um, no, you shouldn't eat animal products um, other than milk. And um, there was a time when he, because he was mostly talking to Indian people who are, you know, very readily, a lot of them are vegetarian already, but when he started teaching to the West, he was asked, you know, for the Western mind, is it also, you know, does it apply? Would, do, do you, can you bend on the vegetarian part of it? And he said, no, absolutely not. If you really want to have, reach a point, you really need to let go of the animal oh, products. Yeah. But it is, you know, you, you also... Food is so important also to, if you're doing those stuff as well, mm -hmm. you know? Even when you are starting to change your food, you will notice that when you are starting to eat processed, uh, processed food, you will start noticing the difference. You really will taste it. Yeah. And your body is always good. And your body and your mind and your whole self-being is starting to respond on right. the stuff what you are eating. So it's really... Well, you do, you, you are lighter in your mm -hmm. being. As, and yes. if you are eating no animal products because you're not dealing with the pain and suffering of the animal coming in, 
you know, you definitely have a different, of a lighter feel Mm -hmm. and, um, people may or may not agree, but that's my belief. And that's, you know, that's why I'm saying it. But I know personally, if I'm eating meat products, I have a different mentality than when I'm not eating them. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm totally agree with that because mm-hmm. I have the same. Yeah. I, I'm experiencing the same. Yeah. You know, so. And it just depends on what you want for your life. You know, um, if you, there's a thing and, and I was reading, I read a wonderful quote and we're just going to get off the subject for a second here, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I read a great quote by a Krishnamurti, if you know who that is. Mm-hmm. Krishnamurti was a young guy. He was in an India, and during the time of the Theosoph- Theosophical Society and Madame Blavatsky and all those people, they were really looking for the new savior to come into the earth. And they, they identified everybody as being um, that every few thousand years that... Um, that a savior would show up on earth when he was needed most. And they identified the savior as, um, who's the person's name I can't think of right now. It starts with an M. Who is the, who is the, uh, what? The, it the starts sa- with an M. I the M? Uh, is it not uh, Maitreya? Yeah, Maitreya, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Maitreya. <laughs> well, they identified that Maitreya would manifest in different bodies over time and that, you know, Jesus was Maitreya. They said Buddha was Maitreya. All these different saints were really Maitreya, Muhammad, and just different times coming in. And they identified this boy, Krishnamurti, as Maitreya. And they raised him up basically to become the new world savior. Well, after, you know, being growing up and Krishnamurti was indeed in touch with, uh, with in touch with Oneness, he, he said he dissolved the organization that they had created around him. And he said, you know, you need to be your own guru. Mm-hmm. But what he said, um, it's not about vegetarianism, but it's about oneness. And I just think it's so poignant and it's such a moving quote that I want to read it. And he was giving a talk and he was very, you know, he was very direct. He didn't mince his words. But he said, do you as human beings realize that we are all one? Basically, fundamentally, not as an idea, but as a fact. First to realize it, not verbally, but in your heart, in your blood, and in your whole thinking, that human beings right through the world go through the same agonies that one goes through, the loneliness, the despair, the depressions, the extraordinary uncertainty, insecurity, whether they live 10,000 miles away or 2,000 miles away or here, we are all psychologically bound together. If one realizes that profoundly in your guts, in your blood, in your hearts, and in your minds, then we are all responsible. And I just thought, whoa. And basically, then he turned to the crowd and said, so why don't you change? And they couldn't say anything to him. No one could make a sound after that. He said, why don't you change? We talk about oneness. We talk about how we're all connected. And yet we walk through our lives like nobody matters. And it's the same with animals. It's the same with everything. When do we believe? This is what Theo says. When do we believe what we say we believe? When do we walk our walk? When do we, when do we, when do we live our lives like we profess that we believe they should be lived? When? Well, Krishnamurti is saying, when do you do it? If you realize that we are one, not as an idea, but as a fact, when do you change? And, uh, and, and, and Bhagavan says, you know, if you go inside and you have this realization, that's all there is. That's, that's the only thing that we should be focusing on. And I, I agree. I really agree. So, 
ask yourself for 2015, when do we live what we say we believe? I think the th- point is we do live what we believe. It may not be what comes out of our mouth, but if we look at how we're living our lives, it shows what we really believe. Everything, your actions, everything what you are doing, you know, yeah. what you're doing. So anyway, but that's my little... It's my little rant on oneness, but I love that. Well, I love that quote, and, and, and it's, for me, it's really, it's really what I'm about. I'm thankful for this show um, because it's clarified that message of oneness so much more because I've been able to talk about it so much. Even, you know, having the idea of it coming in, I know it much more than I ever knew it before. Because I get mm-hmm. to talk about it and explore it. Um, and are you living it? I am living it more and more. Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. And, and I'm not saying that to judge anybody. It's not about the judgment of saying to someone, are you living it? I'm, I'm really trying. And, and, I, and I decided that I'm not leaving this world unenlightened. I am absolutely not. <laughs> I'm absolutely not. I've made some other decisions that I'll tell you about later, but I've made some really, some really, some strong decisions. But yes, this is this is the time to walk the talk and not accept less than that from myself, and and not in a judgmental way, but in a balanced, true, loving way, and to really understand what is real and what is not real. So, here we go. Okay. okay. Where are we? Number 13? Number t- Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, just for we- people who may be just tuning in, what we're doing is we are, as the last show of the year, we're going through the uh, treatise on who am I. I call it a treatise, but it's a discussion of who am I that was uh, given by uh, Sri Ramana Maharshi in 1902, and it is basically saying that to understand the self, the true self, with a capital S, requires self-inquiry, um, and it's about letting go of the I, the me, and the idea of that the world is at all, letting go of what's not real, and focusing on really what is real. So we're halfway through. There's 28 questions. We're at number... 13, but basically we're getting into how do we go about letting go of these thoughts. So, Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, well, number 13. Mm -hmm. The residual impressions, thoughts, or objects appear appear running like the waves of an ocean. Mm -hmm. When will all of them get destroyed? As meditation on the self rises higher and higher, the thoughts will get destroyed. That's clear. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and basically what, what was given before was a beautiful analogy is as, the, as a spider sends out the web, its web from itself, that's like the mind sending out thoughts. And as long as, the, as, long as you're looking outward, um, you are not focused on the self. But when you pull them back in, those thoughts get destroyed. And then by continual inquiry and inquiry, uh, even the question of who am I will be destroyed. So, okay. Well, number 14. <clears throat> Is it possible for the residual impressions of objects that came from beginning this time, as it were, to be resolved and for one to remain as the pure self? Okay. Without yielding to the doubt, is it possible or not, one should persistently hold on to the meditation on the self. Even if one be a great sinner, one should not worry and weep, Oh, I am a sinner. How can I be saved? One should only completely renounce the thought, I am a sinner, and concentrate keenly on the meditation of the self. Then one would surely succeed. There are not two minds one good and the other evil. The mind is only one. It is the residual impressions that are of two kinds, auspicious and inauspicious. When the mind is under the influence of auspicious impressions, it is called good. And when it is under the influence of inauspicious impressions, it's regarded as evil. 
The mind should not be allowed to wander towards worldly objects and what concerns other people. However bad other people may be, one should bear no hatred for them. Both desire and hatred should be eschewed. All that one gives to others, one gives to oneself. Mm. If this truth is understood, who would not give to others? When one's self arises, all arises. When one's self becomes still, all become still. To the extent we behave with humility, to that extent there will result good. If the mind is rendered still, one may live anywhere. This is also about being not judgmental, you know? Yeah. And accept the way it is. Accept everything. And because, then, yeah. And then after accepting it, just, this is also like my favorite sentence, you know? It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Period, you know? Just letting everything be what yes. it is. Yes. Accepting it. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, honoring it. Honoring it and at the same time also letting go, not be mm -hmm. getting attached to something. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, number 15. <laughs> <laughs> How long should inquiry, should inquiry be practiced? As long as there are impressions of objects in the mind, so long the inquiry, who am I, is required. As thoughts arrive, they should be destroyed, and, there, and then and there, in the very place of their origin, through inquiry. So the inquiry is, you have a thought and you think, from whom does this arise? From me. Mm -hmm. And you let it go. If one resorts to contemplation of the self unintermittently until the self is gained, that alone would do. As long as there are enemies within the fortress, they will continue to sally forth. If they are destroyed, as they emerge, the fortress will fall into our hands. Okay, number 16. Hmm. What is the nature of the self? What exists in truth is the self alone. The world, the individual soul, and God are appearances in it. Like silver and mother of pearl, these three appear at the same time and disappear at the same time. The self is that where there is absolutely no I thought. That is called silence. The self itself is the world. The self itself is I. The self itself is God. All is Siva or God. All is the self. And that's self with a capital S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Number 17. Is not everything the work of God? Without desire, resolve, or effort, the sun rises. And in its mere presence, the sun stone emits fire. The lotus blooms. Water evaporates. People perform their various functions and then rest. Just as in the presence of the magnet, the needle moves. It is by virtue of the mere presence of God that the souls governed by the three cosmic functions of the fivefold divine activity perform their actions and then rest in accordance with their respective karmas. God has no resolve, no karma attaches itself to him. That is like worldly actions not affecting the sun or like the merits and the demerits of the other four elements not affecting all pervading space. Does that make sense? To me, it does. Okay, good. To you? Yeah, it does. What I was just thinking was, it's just basically everything is God. Nothing is affecting God, even no. though things are functioning. So, you don't even, have you to... Know, the, 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 there is no... If you're looking to, uh, to that in, from this perspective, mm -hmm. then you still can say to that one sentence, it is what it is. You know, it is what it is. There's nothing good, bad, it is what it is, and nothing is affecting God or, you know. So. Well, things still happen. Things mm -hmm. come and go, but everything is, is, things that are set into motion are still set into motion. Yes. But it's not, um, everything is, is, everything is the work of God, but it's not like God is actively working, no. you know, 
to do it. It's it's because it is like you said. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. okay. Some people really dislike it when I say it. Yes, it is what it is. What? <laughs> okay. And then number eighteen. I like this one too. Of the devotees, who is the greatest? That's always like the person who calls and goes, can you tell me how spiritual I am? Oh, yeah, that's a question. <laughs> it always gives, gives, when I get that question, also, always a little smile appears around my mouth. I always think, yeah, you, you are the most spiritual. You win yeah. the award for the spiritual. Okay. Of the devotees, who is the greatest? He who mm-hmm. gives himself up to the self, that is God, is the most excellent devotee. Giving oneself up to God means remaining constantly in the self without giving room for the rise of any thoughts other than that of the self. Whatever burdens are thrown on God, he bears them. Since the supreme power of God makes all things move, why should we, without submitting ourselves to it, constantly worry ourselves with thought as to what should be done and how, and what should not be done and how not? We know that the train carries all loads. So after getting on it, why should we carry our small luggage on our head to our own discomfort instead of putting it down in the train and feeling at ease? Let go and let God. That is the, yeah. <laughs> that is the phrase. Yeah. It's, I am. it's the one who's the most sincerely given themselves to their... To, to knowing their self is basically, you know, that is, it's not works, it's not anything great that you do, but it's the ones that's the most sincere. And everyone is sincere to their own degree, but it's, mm. that's, it's such a personal thing. There is no greatest. Nobody gets the award for the greatest devotee or a blue ribbon or anything like that. No. Mm. Okay. I like this one as well. Okay. And you, and you knew I, probably I would. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Number 19, what is non-attachment? As thoughts arise, destroying them utterly without any residue in the very place of their origin is non-attachment. Just as the pearl, um, oh, just as the pearl diver ties a stone to his waist, sinks to the bottom of the sea, and then takes the pearls, so each one of us should be endowed with non-attachment, dive within oneself, and obtain the self pearl and obtain the self pearl yeah yeah number 20 mm-hmm. is it not possible for god and the guru to affect the release of a soul yeah people were always saying god save me god save me right and in a lot of times people who are dedicated to gurus also look to the guru to basically at the end save them and I think this is what this question is referring to. And the answer is that God and the guru will only show the way to release. They will not by themselves take the soul to the state of release. In truth, God and the guru are not different. Just as the prey which has fallen into the jaws of a tiger has no escape, so those who have come within the ambit of the guru's grace will be saved by the guru and will not get lost. Yet each one should, by his own effort, pursue the path shown by God or Guru and gain release. One can know oneself only when one's own eye of knowledge and not with somebody else's. Does he who is Rama require the help of the mirror to know that he is Rama? Basically, does he who is God require the help of the mirror to know that he is God? No, Rama knows he's God. Mm-hmm. And so everyone should else, else should know that they are also God. And basically, you can only save yourself. At the yes, end. You, you are the one who has to do it. You know? Yes. Mm-hmm. People like gurus and all teachers, we are only there to show you the way. And teachers themselves are also students, you know. Yeah, teachers you are teacher themselves. and students. Yes, you're, you're, we're also all seeking. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Number 22. Is there no difference between waking no, and... No, 21. Oh, well, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Number 21. Is it necessary for one who longs for release to inquire into the nature of categories? Just as one, this means basically do you have to dive into all the details of mm-hmm. everything? 
I like this answer. It says, just as one who wants to throw away garbage has no need to analyze it and see what it is, so one who wants to know the self has no need to count the number of categories or inquire into their characteristics. What he has to do is reject altogether the categories that hide the self. The world should be considered like a dream. This is just also the song, uh, Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Yeah. You know, That's row. Right. Did you, I was thinking of the song when I was reading this yesterday. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, then now number 22 then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there no difference between waking and dream? Waking is long and dream and a dream is short. Other than that, there is no difference. Just as waking happenings seem real while awake, so do those in a dream while dreaming. In dream, the mind takes on another body. In both waking and dream states, thoughts, names, and forms occur simultaneously. There's a great poem, um, and, and I've quoted it many times, but it's basically that there was a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, and when he awoke, he did not know if he was a man dreaming he was a butterfly or a butterfly mm -hmm. dreaming he was a man. And it's sort of the same. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. like a, what I always say to people, like, okay, while we are awake and talking, are we awake or are we dreaming right now? Yeah, you both. Know, what are we doing? <laughs> what, is, what is reality? Yeah, there's no difference, is there? No. no. Hmm. Otherwise, the dreams can be a bit bizarre. But <laughs> well, life is pretty bizarre too. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. also life can be pretty bizarre. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Number twenty-three. Mm -hmm. Is it any use reading books for those who long for release? And release is being released from the the idea of that the world is real, and being released yeah. from the hold that the world has on us. It says, all texts say that in order to gain release, one should render the mind still. Therefore, their conclusive teaching is that the mind should be rendered still. Once this has been understood, there is no need for endless reading. In order to quiet the mind, one has to inquire within oneself what oneself is. How could this search be done in books? One should know oneself within one's eye. One, one should know oneself with one's own eye of wisdom. The self is within the five sheaths, but the books are outside of them. Since the self has to be inquired into by discarding the five sheaths, it is futile to search for it in books. There will come a time when one will have to forget all that one has learned. Mm -hmm. The five sheaths are the sentences. Yeah. Yeah, and as you know, a book can help you maybe to just a technique or just a tool. Right. But it's not helping you to get to inquire yourself. Well, so. you know, there's definitely a process that people go through. I mean, yeah. you know, searching, this, reading. Well, this is sort of like the big final question. It's just a matter of how do you really get there? I mean, some people can go right there. I mean, he went there right there when he was eight years old. Mm -hmm. You know, he went right to the point. A lot of people dance around a lot of stuff and, you know, we talk about so many different things and multidimensionality and mm -hmm. shifting timelines and all that. But once you really understand truth, you understand it. Yes. And this can help you, you know, reading, studying and just, it, it's just, I think it's just, um, like I said, it's just like... like a tool which can help you to it, it can help start you. growing. And yeah, it can help you to grow. But be basically, once you... Once you know it. Yeah. Well, it's not even knowing it. It's like once you get to the point, it's like you read about a lot of stuff. But the true mm -hmm. moment when you come to your realization is not when you're reading the book. It's when you sit no. down and you start looking inward. And also letting go everything you had ever... Well, that's the part of it. Yeah. That's part of it. You know, that's yeah. part of the looking inward, letting go, letting go of the I self and getting to the silence. Yeah. So, yes, books are good for a while, but at one point you'll just throw them all away. You won't need them at all anymore. You'll mm -hmm. have all, you'll, you'll have the higher, highest knowing. 
Okay. Okay. Number 24. What is happiness? Oh, okay, I have to take a deep breath for this one. It's a long paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. I like this one. Happiness <laughs> is the very nature of the self. You know, Abraham always says we were, we were, you know, you were made to be happy. Well, yeah. Happiness is the very nature of the self. Happiness and the self are not different. There is no happiness in any object of the world. We imagine through our ignorance that we derive happiness from objects. If I have that car, if I got that guy, if I could just get that, this, that, this house, this whatever. When the mind goes out, it experiences misery. In truth, when its desires are fulfilled, it returns to its own place and enjoys the happiness that is the self. Similarly, in the states of sleep, samadhi, and fainting, and when the object desired is obtained or the object disliked is removed, the mind becomes inward turned and enjoys pure self-happiness. Thus, the mind moves without rest, alternately going out of the self and returning to it. Under the tree, the shade is pleasant. Out in the open, the heat is scorching. A person who has been going about in the sun feels cool, and when he reaches the shade... Oh, sorry. Let me say that again. A person who has been going about in the sun feels cool when he reaches the shade. Someone who keeps going from shade into the sun and then back into the shade is a fool. A man, <laughs> a wise man stays permanently in the shade. Similarly, the mind of the one who knows the truth does not leave Brahman. Brahman is, is God. And, and basically, self is Atman. And yes. there's, a, there's a saying in the Bhagavad Gita that is, Brahman is Atman, Atman is Brahman. And that's the same thing. The self is God, God is the self. So, the mind of the ignorant, on the contrary, revolves in the world, feeling miserable and for a little time returns to Brahman to experience happiness. In fact, what is called the world is only thought. When the world disappears, i.e., when there is no thought, the mind experiences happiness, and when the world appears, it goes through misery. I like that. Mm. Basically, in the moment that you're in the still silence of meditation, you're in complete bliss. And I can understand why some of these um, saints, they spend all of their time in deep bliss meditation because in that they're completely happy. They have everything they would ever want. In fact, they want not, no thing, nothing. They are nothing. Mm -hmm. And they're completely in bliss. But here we are running around in our day-to-day -day lives. <laughs> Miserable. And still, you know, there has to Miserable. be a way. Still, there has to be a way to have the nothingness also in this wet ways, you know. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've thought about that a lot. I was having a conversation um, with um, Alison uh, Hamilton, who's a wonderful lady, and you haven't met her yet, but she's a great person. She's in the Consciousness 2.0 group. Mm -hmm. And I said something to the effect of, you know... Um, I can, I basically, I was again talking about the yogis and the things that sit there with their little loincloth and they're in complete happiness and bliss. And she said, well, I know you're joking about that. And I said, I'm absolutely not joking that that is the place because I think what, one of my dogs about to bark, Thomas, do me a favor. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> It's the same you were saying well, to wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. So, so what I meant was going to say is that that I think that there, when you get to the point that you know everything, that you really know it in the purest sense, you really do want nothing. And sitting there with your little whatever clothes you have on becomes enough. I know, but I can also remember a discussion we had when mm -hmm. I was doing my retreat. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you were, you are putting the question towards me like, yes, but do you want to go sit down on a roof, to, on, on a mountain top and just be there? Or do you want to live as a worm under the ground, you know? Mm -hmm. Also when I was saying like, in that state of mind, in that meditation, it's so blissful. Mm -hmm. And it made me think that, uh, well, I started thinking about it and I said, no, I don't want to live as a worm in the ground. Though I 
really do believe there has to be um, a way to also do that in, in the wet ways, which is called the world, you know. You can also do this in the world, and maybe you can do it if you're not, um, if you are just letting the things the way they are, and you just, like, stay with your own true self. And, you know, so I'm still looking for a way to, uh, I still believe in the integration also in this world, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I don't know. I, I I don't know. I think there does... I mean, you know, what I was asking you is because you were... The reason I was asking you, and I wasn't saying that it's not possible, the reason I was mm. asking you, because I was asking you, are you wanting to leave everything and go live that life? I think yeah. it's very hard to live that life in this world like we live it. If you do reach that stage of true enlightenment... So much of everything that you want is gone. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a great thing. But I think so much, you know, if you're completely one with everything, if you really are, and you really have that knowing, everything really falls away. Everything. Mm-hmm. Your desires for anything. You can go be one sitting on a beach and eating only rice every day. Because for the rest, you don't. Need it. You don't need it. You, you, you're not making a story about anything. Nothing. You will see nothing. So it your life simplifies to such a degree that I think you don't live in the rat race. That's what I'm saying. As long as you... As long as you're in this sort of world, it, there's, a, there's a part of you that has to hold on to the illusion because when the illusion really slips away, when you really let it go, then it's gone. You won't see it anymore. You really mm-hmm. won't see it. You have to pull your. You would have to pull your focus back into the world to see it again. You know. Uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm just still wondering about that. You I don't know. You do know, you know the Do you hmm. know the the books of uh, a writer called Chad McKenna? No. He also has written a lot about self realization and enlightenment. Mm-hmm. And he 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 went there, you know. So he was, and still it's like, while I was reading his books, I was thinking like, okay, maybe I, you can sit there and in your highest knowing. Mm-hmm. And you are in the wet ways, but you are not taking part in the wet ways. You are just being there. So that's why I think, like, maybe it's possible to just integrate everything. So not taking part of the illusion. You are just in the illusion without taking part in the illusion. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. But I think things like... I mean, I don't know. I just think if you... If we really, in this lifetime, reach to that level, I don't know that you can, you can, it, it becomes very hard to function in the world because your function is inward. Mm-hmm. Your focus is so inward. You really stop functioning in outside. You know, you really do because everything is internal. You're so lost in the sea of tranquility and bliss that you're not focused outward at all. There's someone that has a question, and I want to take it because they okay. just logged on, and they, maybe it's someone who has something to contribute to our conversation. <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> Hi, uh, 520, this is Karen and Crystal. Did you have a question? Yes, hello, Karen and Crystal. This is hi. Renee in Tucson, Arizona. <gasps> oh, hi, Renee in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Crystal. This is Renee from Tucson, Arizona. Hi, she Renee. She and I have been corresponding uh, via the email, and she's a very, very nice lady. So, hi, Chris. Hi, Crystal. Hi, and, Renee. <laughs> How are you? Hi. And, and thank you. Happy New Year, and thank you for this program that you're doing today. You know, oh. what you're talking about now, mm-hmm. I have given this a lot of thought, mm-hmm. having been raised as a Catholic right. by what some, some people may refer to as a fanatic Catholic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> had some exposure 
in my early years to cloistered communities. Mm. Uh, my mother would incorporate it into our driving excursions to drive to um, cloistered communities of nuns in, in, in our Sunday drives and make a donation, a barrel of apples or something. And I mean, I clearly remember going into these places as a child, mm -hmm. and, and I've thought about it a lot as, as an adult. I mean, it seems to me that anyone who truly wants to escape all wants or needs can easily do so by yeah. running away or, in my opinion, escaping to any religion that has these, these sure. types of communities. Mm -hmm. There may be a vow of silence. Or, but the fact is, whether you're in a convent or a monastery, like that, the fact is your, all your material needs, just so that you can survive, have food, shelter, and clothing, have to be provided for by other people. Yes. Right? Yes. And basically, it seems to me, as, as someone who has studied the world religions and thinks of herself as a, a spiritual humanist, that this is truly escapism and a lazy way out. If all you are doing, all of your days, I mean, obviously you have work within your community. You may be farming or uh, doing doing other activities, producing crafts that you sell, which helps maintain your community, whatever. But the fact is you're spending a lot of your time doing what current day societies think of as non-productive work. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, we talk about the power of prayer. And, um, you know, I believe in that, but the fact is it's not what society views as positive work. You're also, if, if you're running away like that, which is how I can't help but think of it, you never take on yourself the responsibility of children or family or of, of, of caring for others other than in a very regimented way where you're told what to do, how to think, how to spend your days. And I just, it seems to me if we're in this level, we're in this third density civilization here, we're here because we're meant to participate in it not escape from it. Yeah, well, that's what, and I, that's what that I that tried. With, yeah, that, that, I, that withdrawal, what that withdrawal will come after we've died and passed on to the next level. But it's, it seems to me lazy or irresponsible to try that kind of escapism while we're still alive. In, in a certain way, I agree with you, Renee. Like, no, I wouldn't, maybe it's a, a, a escapism. Well, that's what I uh, was trying to say to Karen when I was saying, like, I, I do think, honestly, it's possible to live this life into this wet ways, into this world. And it's not probably necessary to go in a, in a monastery or go sitting on a mountaintop. I honestly do think it's, it's possible. I think it's possible, and I think it's also, I think for every person, it's if everyone's experiencing something different, then it's whatever your, your highest joy is. Mm -hmm. For many people, giving to charity, like for your mom, stopping and giving apples or something, is her contribution that allows, you know, these people to, um, to pursue their to pursue their life. But, you know, it's so individual. I mean, it may or may not be lazy. And you can, you know, you can say, well, they didn't take part in raising children. Well, maybe they already raised their children and they went into this life. It's, it's not a clear answer because everybody's on a different level. And for everyone, there's a different desire and there's a different joy. Some people have such great joy doing different things. I do, though, however, think that if we really reach a stage of enlightenment, I think it becomes impossible to live completely in the world, only because you will want nothing. You won't want a house. You won't want all these things. You're just going to want to stay within your blissful state. I mean, I think it's no... Um, it's no coincidence that people like Buddha and the, these people who go off and sit under trees and in nature that sit there for three and five months and never move, that's all they do because they're so inwardly focused. They're not able but to. Had his foot. Hmm? 
But he had his full life before that. Well, that's what I'm saying. So mm-hmm. who's to, like, that's exactly what I said. Who's to say that someone didn't do a lot of the things before that? I'm yes. not recommending that everyone just chuck it all in and go <laughs> live in an ashram. I'm just saying that there's just a point where you will, if you really, if we really reach this state of true knowing on the level of, of, of say, a fully realized person, it becomes very difficult to live in the world. You know, I knew a man, uh, mm-hmm. he's a good friend of mine, and I told you about him. Right. And he died in a, in, on a very young age. Mm-hmm. He reached his self-realization. Mm-hmm. And you know what I saw happening was like mm-hmm. when he was reaching the state, mm-hmm. soon, within a few months, he left his world. Right. And he right. was in, well, that's, so. That's my point. Yeah. That's my point. That while you're here, why not participate actively and give back to others, even if it's in in, in a more secular environment like like a kibbutz. But we're sure. actively doing yeah. something. Well, no one's saying that. No one's saying this, that it's. Well, well no one's saying and that you don't. Nothing. All day. No, but I, this but, guy did it. Okay, but but you know? Renee, but why is why why I don't think it's so. I don't think it's so extreme. I don't think we're recommending anything. I'm just saying that you know that it, that's just one way. But of course, give back, live your life. Live your life in awareness, but it, they're not mutually exclusive. It's not one way or the other. It's every multiple way that can that can go. But who's judging? Who's doing what? I mean, there's no police saying, "Okay, you haven't lived and contributed enough to the world, so you're not allowed to leave." And it's not only escapism. It's it's what people really feel inspired. I mean, a lot of people went to into. Uh, cloistered life because they felt a calling not to escape but because yeah. they felt that their life was in service to God and they spend some, their some life teaching and yeah. feeding the poor and doing whatever some of them had a calling and maybe a little group, group well, that's not a was using it as an escape so if, you're do, if you're doing all that that's not a cloistered existence okay well then what is that then Hello. Well, that's what that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I think there should be a balance. Yes, I. Um, well, I think I there probably is often, a balance look, now, isn't there? I, I have often thought that that people need to stop and reflect more in their lives instead of rushing from one hour and one day to the next mm-hmm. and never stopping and and reflecting on, uh, you know, as, as you're saying, who, who we are and where we want to be, but. Um, I just I, I, I think I think of not wanting anything mm-hmm. as being the goal. Not it, it, that it. I can't see the point in it being the practice. That it should be the goal, which is what happens when we pass over. But while we're here, that we're here, we're given human bodies to use as a tool to be active, to do something other than just sit and think or think nothing. <laughs> Well, that's for you, though. But that's truly Mm -hmm. for you. I don't think that you can, we can, anybody can prescribe what everyone should do. Whatever your highest joy is, I think that's the point. It's whatever your highest joy is, pursuing your awakening in whatever way that you, the whatever way that you feel led. If it's serving the poor, I'm all for serving the poor and, and, and asking what can you give in life more than what can you get. I believe that's more important. Um, that is being part of the world, you know, doing the things. I don't think that you have to... But if you want to, hmm. if you want to serve the poor, that means you still want something. You still want to do sure. something. You still yeah. want to be sure. active and contributing, which is very different from doing nothing or wanting nothing or thinking yeah. nothing i think it's about just doing no, don't think anything don't want anything just do it doing you know well again i don't think that everything's mutually exclusive so i think that there's because i think there's a place for everybody there's those that will you know want to you know just do as you're describing living in the world and 
taking part in it. And then there will be those, and there are those throughout time who have spent a lot of time looking inwards. And then there are those who feel the need to give apples. And then there are those who feel the need to not do that, to just live their lives and, you know, have their really worldly existence. I mean, there are millions and multiple possibilities and it's all right. There's nothing that's wrong with it. It's nothing that has to happen for anybody. The, I, the, the, the whole point of what we're reading, this, this treatise is about people who are asking the question, who am I? Who am I? And the, the answer is that the self is who we are. The self is God. The self is everything. But in order to actually totally know that, you have to let go of the idea of the world. And in order to let go of it, you can't look at it anymore. You have to completely let it go, at least based on what this teaching is saying. This is what we're communicating. So, yeah, <laughs> there's no, you know, there's no right answer. It's wherever, wherever anybody wants to be in their life and whatever anybody wants to pursue. But it's all right. And I think it's really, I mean, you're, you're much, the thing is for you, and I know just based on talking to you, you're so much a doer that if anybody were to tell you not to do anything, it freaks you out as I can hear in what you're saying. (laughs) It just goes against everything that you are. So for someone to say, Renee, I'm sorry, from now on, you're going to sit in meditation for the rest of your natural life. That would be like, just, I would kill myself. You would kill yourself. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, we don't want that. That is not the goal at all. That is not okay, the goal oh at God. all. You, you, you know, I, res- I respect your views and, and I appreciate uh, well, there, you know, there are views the exploration about, that you share with oh, us. Oh, thank you. Well, the views are only, like I said, they're not recommendations for anyone's lives. It's just a discussion. But I will say personally myself that I will do not want to leave this world unenlightened. And I, and I mean enlightened in the Buddha kind of way. I, that's what I really want in my life. So probably at some point in my life, I will run away to an ashram. I will give everything away or sell everything, and I will go live there and never come out again and spend my life feeding the poor people and living with just my small amount of clothes and really letting it all go. I really think that that will be my future. Um, but that's mine. Well, Everyone it, can it do does, what they want. That's what you want, and that, yeah. and that makes you fulfilled, and that's what yeah, exactly. spiritually, uh, at, least, at least you've already had a life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, a it's, a, it's a luxury choice, isn't it? It's a kind of thing to say, okay, I've done everything yes. that I wanted to do. Now I'm going to go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's really, I mean, I look at it as not giving back. If you're not contributing anything to society, I mean, to me, that seems the most selfish of all. If we, if we truly... Well, if I'm feeding the poor, is that doing, selfish? Doing things, doing things, doing things for others. So feeding the poor is is I I did say feeding the poor in there. No, no, no. I'm talking <laughs> about an existence where all you do is pray or meditate all the time, and everything else is done for you. And there are communities like that all around the world, hmm. where the people in them do not lift a finger. Every every single one of their material needs are provided for by their patrons or the communities around them. Hmm. Well, you can look at it from the fact of, you know, if we create our our own realities, look what they've been able to create for themselves. They've created a place where they can sit and meditate all day, and they've created a place where they, they, by law of attraction, have brought around them people who are happily providing for them. And the people who are providing for them are probably joyfully giving. So are you going to take the joy away from the people happily giving? I mean, these are pretty powerful creators, if you want to look at it from that standpoint. You know, there's room for everything. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, those are, for, those are some really good creators, you know. 
So every, there's room for everybody, everybody, and no one is going to ever make you go and do nothing. I can promise you that. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And I hope you don't ever disappear on us because because your your words are important and the thoughts that you that you share with your audience around the world um, is, is something that should continue. Well, thank you. I'm not saying I'm running stopped. away now. I'm not run, and I, don't, I wouldn't see it as running <laughs> away. I'm just saying that at some point I, I, do, I do see that as being something in my future. But we'll see how it all turns out. Renee, I'm going to put, if you want to stay well, on the line, you can, can or, but I'm going to take another call. Today. Sure. Do you want to stay on thank the line you. or do you want to stay on the line or do you want to? No, uh, I'm fine. I'll listen, I'll listen off air. Namaste. 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 She's so funny. I like her so much. Okay. All right, let's take another call. 905, are you there? Hello? Hi, Karen. Hi, who's this? Hello. This is uh, Dennis and Dreamaster. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Dennis. How are you? (laughs) And and it's um, Mm -hmm. Crystal, too? Yes, Crystal. Yes. 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 Right, hi. Um, I I always love your sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and you brought up a few points, and as I was waiting on, on hold, mm. you were sharing with Renee. Right. And brought up a few other points. She's good, isn't which, she? She always know, has so I, many good points. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I would like to share on as well. Please. It goes. Um, well, it, it, the first thing is... In regards to, okay, okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> just throw it you out really, there. You, you were speaking. Yeah, I'm trying <laughs> to breathe here. <laughs> yeah, it's good. That's a good thing to you do. You were speaking earlier in regards to um, uh, um, focusing or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think you used that word, but um, but it's 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 connecting to your higher self per se and, and connecting to and this is this is this is my take on what you were mentioning and what I was getting. Mm-hmm. Right. And and a lot of people are, are are humans. They're so wrapped up and you mentioned rat race, uh, wrapped up in this three D all these three D distractions. Right. And and this is something that that we cannot fall into um it's 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 a time now where that the energy we're coming into really um self-awareness right and and, and where we are uh within the universe like really and and that you know that the, that we've existed before we were born and we will exist after um you know we, we, we're finished here and and that's that's what's really going on right now is, is coming to that realization, and and walking through, um, if you want to call it that, uh, through this 3D um, reality, uh, this, this this here and now that we are all sharing together, um, it's it's how we move through it is what's key. Mm-hmm. And you were mentioning gurus and monks and stuff like that 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 sit on beaches and stuff for months on end eating rice. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, too, um, it's what it is about is it just experiencing humanness and sharing with others. This right. is what it is. This is what I found. Right. Mm-hmm. And and I, I I do need to do my daily chores. You know, mm-hmm. I do need to go to work. I do need to deal with, um, you know. The, the, Family, friends, or whatever energies that that happen to be coming around me, that positive or negative, whatnot, there's still energies that that I'm interacting with within this 3D physicality, and and like you were mentioning meditation, and I think um, Gandhi said that the best medication is during dream time, and right. I think this is what is, is going to really occur for a lot of people that that are are are, st- are starting to put pieces of the puzzle together. Is is a lot of the answers that we're asking ourselves is within dream time, and when we when we process um, our, our our too deep every day. This is what I do. I've been doing this for years, 
and 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 it and it and it and it's processed in the day's event. And and again, you know, it, it's like you know, it's hard not to be angry at times, but you know, it's it, 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 it understanding, being compassionate, and and you know, just just seeing things through. Uh, seeing things through um, a perspective that is not from yours but without judgment mm -hmm. right? and, and mm -hmm. it's really hard for people and, and this is where that understanding comes in and compassion comes in and, and you know even forgiveness of others actions comes in which is right. a big one for a lot of people and, and also um, loving unconditionally right this is also a big one for people. And, and when we're so wrapped up in dramas, in ego, we say, because, you know, when, when, when one person picks a fight with another, you know, all of a sudden we got two egos button heads. <laughs> it always doesn't come out always so well. Right. right? <laughs> and and, and this, is, this is where, this is where, for me, <clears throat> I find, I, I've, I've done anger before. I know of anger, right? I know of frustration. I, I know of these emotions, right? People say, I'm stoic. <laughs> I, I am without emotion. Mm -hmm. But um, I know them very, very well. I just don't show them much. I, I, I work subtle. I work subliminally. I work undercover, per se. Uh, I'm not standing on the soapbox yelling and screaming, hey, this is what you should be doing with your life. Um, you know, what, I, what I'm here for is to mention, to share. I'm not right. here to push and to tell. Right. right? And, and I think that's really, really important. I think the um, thing is, too, just to interrupt you for a second, when people, when people are asking, I answered this question on Rob Gothier's show the other day. He said, what do you find the most difficult thing about, about talking about, you know, yourself? And I said, well, you know, it's never about pushing. It's about if someone's asking you the question, then they're open to sharing. If they're not asking, there's really nothing to share other than love. I mean, you, you just have to be and let everyone else right. be. And it's, you know, it's never about converting anybody. It's never about telling anybody how to live. Right. It's just about being in yourself and, and, and being your true self. And when you really are your true self, you are only love. So you don't have to do much people, then. Right, and people... Sorry, go ahead. No, that was it. That's all I had. Yeah, this, yeah this, this, is what people, this is what people, I find, are doing more so now. Mm. Is, is, is they'll take almost a, a, a millisecond uh, second look at, at, at what they're, how they're about to react to somebody's action. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, they, and, they, and they react differently than that they would normally do. Right. Like, like that, their their that their ego or their protection state or their their whatever their you know uh, self preservation state might take, right? And and they're looking at people more of of where where the action is coming from. Right? See, this is what's going to change. Mm -hmm. See, you know, 2014 was was about a lot of shedding. Right yeah. of, of, of what is not required, right? Right. Um, what is, right. does not serve or whatnot. 2015 is, is going to be more <laughs> of realizing um, who we really are in this universe. Yes. And yeah. and 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 it, and again, you know, I, I love your show title oneness. Um, a part of it, anyway. Um, and. Yeah, the interconnectivity that we all share within source core consciousness, and and yeah, and and we're you know a lot of people are are, are walking around like especially last year, are walking well still this year, <laughs> walking around wondering what's going on, mm -hmm. why is this happening to me, why well you know why is this and why is that and why is that, well you know what because a lot of people don't want to change on their own, right what they know that needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Or no, they're, 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 <laughs> they're subconscious doesn't even know what needs to be changed. But your consciousness does, your unconscious does. Right. Right. 
Well, yeah, what I right think. Now, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, I don't want. To, I don't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to. I wanted to just. You know, I think that everything exists on a spectrum, and everything is at its own level of that spectrum. You know, and you have every. You have. Right. You have one. You have the two extremes on either side, and then everything in between, and somewhere everyone yeah. falls into that. Everyone, we have the idea that everyone is exactly where they need to be. We don't need to so much worry about what other people are doing or saying or thinking or wondering. We only have to look at ourselves and, and our own walk towards awareness is paved with all the experiences that will help us get there. And it's only us creating that path for ourselves. And I always think, who loves us more than us? Well, nobody. So we are trying to create for ourselves, on the highest level, the most interesting path to get there. And so for some people that may involve, and maybe as just a little bit of fun, it involves a whole lot of ignorance in not knowing where they are and really going to, into such deep forgetfulness that they just have a hell of a time getting out. And not only do they have a hell of a time getting out, but part of their fun is to keep as many people with them in their party for as long as they can, just because that's something that they find interesting. And then there's other people who, you know, get closer and closer to knowing who they are. But it's all valid experience. It's all our own creation. It's just where do you want to be? Where do you, personally you, and I, personally I, want to take my life? And for the rest, everybody has to do their own thing. And, and the, the realization of the oneness is understanding that difference. Understanding that everyone has their own choice. Everyone is free to be and do and say and have and understand whatever it is they're going to understand. That's what true allowing is. That's what true acceptance. And that's what truly understanding the oneness is. Letting everyone be who they are because we know that ultimately they are us and ultimately it's all okay. So... Right. It's just... Hmm. It's just like, this, just because you, you don't see me doesn't mean I'm not there. Okay? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and um, you know, and it's a good thing, you know. And, and it's like, again, just go back. Um, Can I tell you something very um, interesting has happened? It's been 940 for at least five minutes on my time clock. I think we just had a really nice time <laughs> jump. <laughs> no time has passed in the last in the last moments, but it's we've been talking for a while, and it's not switched the clock yet for a, quite a while. We're having a nice phenomena at the moment. Mm. <laughs> um, that's not something I'm new to. <laughs> huh? That's not something I'm new to. <laughs> no, me either. Me either. So that was really cool. Do you have another yeah. point? We have one more caller, so I want to uh, let that person also come on uh, and please, say something. Please take the caller. Um, you know, uh, you know, just just one more minute, then maybe. Sure. Um, I want to give time for your other caller. Okay. It, 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 you know, 2015 is going to be phenomenal. We, yes. You know, we've been, you know, I've been going through changes and witnessing changes um, for for many, many, many years. I've mm -hmm. been seeing this coming for for a long time, and. And again, this is the time. This right. is the time. Right. And and, and embrace it. And, and again, please don't hold fear or doubt. You know, that's that's the worst enemies. Exactly. You know, fear, doubt, <laughs> anger, hate. You all have to stop. It's awful. You know, just, just don't hold on to that because a lot of that has originated, if not all of it, um, you know, from 3D experiences, how other people treat other people. And, and you know, it's, you know, things are going to change. Everything's changing. It's getting better for sure. Thank you so much, Dennis. Yeah. It's always nice to talk to you. I'm going to put you back on hold. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Namaste. Bye-bye. 
just while I have everybody, I want everyone to know that my guest next week on the 4th of um, January is going to be Matt Kahn. If you're familiar with him and his teachings, it's going to be really, really nice. He will be on for an hour and a half. So half hour into the show, I'll bring him in. He'll be taking callers questions. So if you've ever wanted to speak to Matt Kahn, uh, definitely, definitely tune in. Okay. We, I, I wanted to get that in because we're coming up to the end of the, of the, we have about 20 minutes left and the announcements will come on, but I'm going to play those at the end. So if I didn't, if you didn't hear that announcement, I wanted you to hear it. So one more, we have one more call. Let me just grab this person. You still there, Crystal? I'm still there. Awesome. Hi, this is the person I think is on a Skype call. Hello. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Karen. It's Roxy. How are you? Oh, hey, Roxy, hey. Roxy, Foxy, Roxy. <laughs> How hey, you doing? baby doll. What a, I'm wonderful. Just tuning in and just... Well, I've been listening the whole time, not just tuning in. <gasps> just uh, wow, tuning in. Did you hear my Christian Murty quote? Huh? No, I did not. <gasps> <What was that? laughs> well, just, just listen to I'm it in the playback. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What did you say about Krishnamurti? Well, I just read a quote to Krishnamurti, and I said how passionate he was about um, oneness. And, and I'm going to read it. Can I read it again? Because yeah. I already read it. <laughs> I want to read it again. Read it again. All right, I'll read it. I love it. JK. I, you're, you're loving Krishnamurti, huh? Okay. Well, I just I love... I just love what he said, and he's the, you know, he's the anti-guru, but at the same time, he was a guru. Yeah. <laughs> so he right. said, he said, and I just love this, he said, do you as human beings realize that we are all one? Basically, fundamentally, not as an idea, but as a fact. First to realize it, not verbally, but in your heart in your blood, in your whole thinking, that human beings right through the world go through the same agonies that one goes through, the loneliness, the despair, the depressions, the extraordinary uncertainty and insecurity, whether they live 10,000 miles away or 2,000 miles away or here. We are all psychologically bound together. If one realizes that profoundly in your gut, in your blood, in your hearts, in your mind, then we are all responsible. Yeah. yeah I just love that. I just love, I just love that because it's so, it, it comes down to the question. And then, then the next thing he says is, if you believe it, if you know it, why don't you change? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just True. love it. It's so... I like his in-your-face, you know, saying, you know, we say what we, we say what we believe. And to go back to Renee's point, you know, I was saying, well, you know, at some point I'm just going to go live in an ashram and just give away everything and do that. That's good. But that's going to be my highest joy, so that's why I'm going to do that. But the whole point is, is we say we believe certain things. But do we live them? And that's the, that's the point. I mean, that is the awakening. That is moving into oneness. What we're talking about is, is going from the idea, waking up to this idea, and really living it, however that manifests. But it will manifest right. in a greener world. It will manifest in a kinder world. Because if you really understand the connection, you can't. Well, if, well, let me just say this. If you understand truly the connection and you live like a jerk, then you're truly a jerk. At least when, <laughs> at least when you have no idea, you know, then you can always say, well, I didn't know. But if you know, how can you not give? That's just what, this well, what, yeah, wait, that's wait, what Sri wait. Ramana said. Wait. He said, how can mm. you not give? Because okay, wait, 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 you're giving wait. to yourself. Wait a minute. What? Stop. No. <laughs> Say the word again. Say it again, Karen. You always interrupt people. Now it's my turn to interrupt you. <laughs> what do you? What did? What did? What was the quote? If you know, then how could you? No, right? Yeah. Well, apparently they don't know that. Exactly. Because if you know, wait a minute. Okay, so don't get mad at them. I'm not mad. They can claim it. They can what? Hmm. 
See, the, the question in and of itself is a paradox to me. It is. Because they're claiming if you don't, if you don't know, then how could you? Well, apparently they don't know that. So exactly. Don't allow them. No matter what they're claiming, no matter what they're believing, no matter what they're saying, no matter what they're acting, that's their joy. Allow them. Of course. That's when we stop limitations. That's when we stop everything. Well, that's the whole point. So if you know, know, you know. Right. So why even have the question? That in and of itself is a paradox, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a question so we can have this great show and talk about all the questions, you know? Yeah. And by the way, it's not just a discussion. You always discount your own work. But that's okay. That's you. Okay. Earlier in the conversation with Renee, you said it's just a discussion. It's not just a discussion. It's your joy expanding, bringing all these together to create this new part of humanity. Well, it's I, awesome. yeah, right. I mean, it is, a, but it's a discussion about that. So, yeah. I understand it. But you discount a lot yourself. It's okay to be that awesome, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> just, just say thank Hi, you. Crystal, just, Karen, you? just say thank you, Waxy. That's enough. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> oh, you're so cute. <laughs> oh, but, no, but that was a really good stuff. I love what Renee was saying, and I love what you were saying about it, and how all the beliefs were, you know. If you go back and listen to the entire conversation, it was, wow, you know. You just got to let it be. Because everyone has their own point of view and their own right. idea, you right. know. If right. you want to give, then give. Don't get mad at the one who's not giving. Let them be that. For right. that is letting. That is allowing. Right. They'll see in the mirror their time. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good show today. Really good stuff. I loved it. I was like, hmm, awesome. <laughs> so, you know, I just voice at the chime in. You said you did just what? I missed that. What you just said? I always have to chime in. I love it. You do have to chime in, but that's really cool. I like that when I'm you chime in. Ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> it's Avon calling. <laughs> it's Avon calling. Avon calling. What is? It's whatever your highest joy is, you know. And and again, what I was saying to Dennis is everything exists on the spectrum, and you're saying it's a paradox, and I and I'm saying everything is a spectrum. That everyone is where they are, and they're exactly where they need to be. The point is, is when you get to the point when you truly understand, you know, you, you don't have to, you're not judging other people for not doing something. You're totally understanding that they're doing their own thing. Um, but, but the point is that, that I want to make to people, the point is I want to make to people, if, if you know, you, you, you know. And obviously, like you said, well, then they obviously don't know. And, and yeah, exactly. Right. That's exactly the point. Right. Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, it's all love. And I, mm -hmm. from what I'm discovering, my journey, when you realize everything, and I do mean every little ounce of experience you have is unconditional love, mm -hmm. then you will only view it as that when you know. Right. Right. When you know. No contract. Yeah, it's that. That's yeah. the that's the linchpin of it all. Is the is the knowing yeah. and the, the win. And and I'm not saying that. And it's not the the time limitation of it. It's like, but when you wake up, and and what do you think about what we were talking about of the no? I have this idea, and it's just my idea. But I just have this idea that when you really get to the place where you really really know really, really know your, your desire. And it goes through back to this, um, this teaching that we are talking about, um, this, what am I, uh, teaching right. that one of the questions is what is the relationship between desirelessness and wisdom? And the answer is desirelessness is wisdom. The two are not different. They are the same. Desirelessness is refraining from turning the mind towards any object. Wisdom means the appearance of no object. In other words, not seeking what is other than the self, the self with a big S, is detachment or desirelessness. Not leaving the self is wisdom. What Ramana, uh, what Mom, Ramana Maharshi said is the idea is to be so one-pointed in your thought that you're only focused on the self. And if you're only focused on the self or what is real, 
everything else dissolves away. There, you can't. And, right. and basically, as, as you're looking out to the world, as long as you're looking out into the world, you're seeing your thoughts as you've created them. But those aren't real. Right. So when you really see the self, you're not seeing anything else. And when you desire nothing other than knowing the self, if you're only in the self and you're in that silence, there is nothing else. So what I had said earlier is that there does come a point where in the truest knowing of knowing, if you are still on this world, earth you really won't function in in the way of a person walking around you really will become like one of those people who sits on a mountain and stays in deep meditation because in that moment you're in complete bliss of knowing nothingness i love i love that part but now i'm going to add in this context as a Mm -hmm. perception from me when i when you read that part Mm -hmm. That was in a certain time that he wrote that. A certain understanding of the human collective in and of itself and the awareness of itself as a human collective. And this now, we have gotten more expansion, more ideas that we are creators in the moment, moment and we are ever expanding creators. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to a point of realization of what you are upon earth, your journey is over. I dare say, as of Ramtha, as of the other Seven Masters, they continue on into another plane. They well, won't well, there yeah. be nothing here, you know? They, they do continue on another plane, but not here. Right. Yeah, well, that's, well, so that's, 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 that's implied. That's implied. I'm talking about Earth like, existence, yeah. Right. Because, because, okay, well, don't, because that's what Rene was saying when I got Rene's point, because... You don't just sit there and turn inwardly and do nothing. Because if you know, there's going to be something you're going to want to do. And I think that was birthed from her conversation when I got that same idea, was you move on. Because we are truly that of creators. We're all that is, and we will continue to expand that. Make sense? Mm -hmm. That kind of idea. So I, I think it is implied, but I think a clarity was needed because... When I know here, when I am enlightened as your seeking is the same, for my seeking, I really do want to become that enlightened master. Mm -hmm. When that is complete upon this plane, off to see the wizard. You know, I'm going. I'm going to go find out what's next because I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm done. Let's move on and expand this self, this soul, this conscious, this all part of all that is to continue weaving the fabric of life through all all of creation. Right, right. Well, I think that there are people who sort of reach that state only to be an example for other people that it is truly possible. Do you know what I mean? That's why there's so few of them. And that's why, you know, if not, the mountains and the caves would be just chock full of people. (laughs) Right. <laughs> there wouldn't That's be a seat. There would like there was no absolute. room at the end. There would be no place for anybody in the cave to sit down because everybody would be so enlightened all walking right. around. Yeah. And like you said, that's their representation, and I love it. Let mm-hmm. everyone represent themselves in their highest joy, and then choose after of those offerings, bite of the apple, if you will, as you say, and continue on yours by following your joy, your truth, your expansion to see what's in store for you. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Let's just do the, the last two. Number 27 is, what is the difference between inquiry and meditation? And the answer is, inquiry consists in retaining the mind in the self. Meditation consists in thinking that oneself is Brahman, that oneself is God. Existence, consciousness, bliss. And then the, the, the last question is, what is release? Inquiry into the nature of oneself that is in bondage and realizing one's true nature is release. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so cool. I know you're short on time. You still have the announcements to do, so I'll get off here. So we're doing a Tuesday show, yeah? Well, I a Tuesday show on Pyramid One Network is supposed to be... Uh, a language gym with the people from Human Colony, though I don't know that that's going to be the case. It might be a language gym with you and me and some other people. <laughs> but 
but I haven't heard anybody from Human Colony actually commit to doing it other than Rowley and Gabriel. So it might be the four of us. Yeah, Rowley, Gabriel, and I think Sarah's going to be there too. Perfect. We'll okay, well then that's great. So yes, on Tuesday on the Pyramid One Network, we are going to do a, a language gym for in, uh, for galactic languages. Everyone speaking galactic languages. Right. And it will be on Pyramid One Network on 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Next week on the show, I will have, as I said earlier, Matt Kahn. So it's going to be a really exciting show. Very exciting. Yes. Very exciting. Call in early awesome. because those lines are going to really fill up. Um, I... You know, I've never spoken to him, so I may or may not take callers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I will definitely <laughs> take callers. <laughs> but I'm going to want him all to myself. No, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, I love everybody. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play the announcements as the extra for the show. Um, it's been great talking to everyone. Thank you so much, Crystal. It's been a really fun and expansive conversation. 90 seconds. And it's giving me the... Uh, me on. Well, you're always welcome, Roxy. And thank you to Dennis for calling in and also to Renee. Thanks to Dream Master One in the chat and Mark Hobbs and everybody else who participated in the show tonight. So thank you very Mark's much. Out there. Hi, Mark. Love you, baby. <laughs> okay. Love you, everyone. I'm going to play the announcements. And they're much shorter this week. They're only 7 minutes and 27 seconds. So good night and namaste. Okay.